Awesome. Hey, this is Luke, everyone. Um, welcome to the November DEF CON 864 group meeting. I wanted to spend just a little time, and, and I guess I wasn't clear with Ben. I didn't want to spend the entire time talking about this, but hey, if it goes into roundtable, that's great. Uh, my part of the conversation will probably be about 15 minutes or so. Perfect. So just to dive in, what this is all about is some notes that I was privy to from an anonymous employer sharing anonymous hiring notes throughout their, um, their interviews. So I just wanted to anonymously share this with everyone. And maybe, um, maybe we can all learn a couple of things, a thing or two about from a hiring manager, what they're looking at, what they're hearing from, um, from interviewees, and how in the future, if any of us have to interview, we could do it better. So on the screen, I've got a couple of maybe you could say heavy hitters, the, the positive keywords that I saw coming up over and over throughout the, the <coughs> conversations uh, based on the, the notes that I read. Now, of course, this is, some of this could be anecdotal because I'm not seeing the whole picture. I wasn't part of the interviews. I didn't hear the conversations. All I'm seeing are the notes. So take it with a grain of salt, but I think there is some value to, um, to be had in this. So as you notice, one of the the, the things throughout this whole um, this whole conversation that we should keep in mind is this is thinking between the lines and this is going beyond simply having um, having the skills that are asked for in the job. Now there were a couple of um, of applicants that I saw in here that didn't quite have the skills to hit the ground running, but they somehow showed some motivation or some ability to learn quickly so that they could hit the ground running quickly. Uh, that's not very evident throughout these notes, but do think about that um, as we as we talk about this because it's it's mainly a lot of things that you just have to read between the lines. Um, unfortunately, there's no um, there's no measurement for that, and and there's also no measurement for how likable somebody is when they're talking to um, to a hiring manager or or a recruiter during the interview, and that's where we see very nice showing up a lot. I'm not quite sure how they how they gauge very nice, but since I saw it so many times, and this is as of um, maybe October the 20th, since then there have been a couple more interviews and I don't have the notes for those, or I didn't update this, um, this count fully. But even being kind and polite and nice on a call with an interviewing manager could make or break your interview. Now some of us in the technical field don't think about that very often, but it really does matter how we come across to others. And if you're kind of grumpy and, and you're kind of short and um, almost not very talkative, then you might not come across as being very personable. And depending on the job that the hiring manager is looking to fill, uh, that could make a difference. Now, in this anonymous team that, that this data comes from, it's a customer-facing consultancy that happens to be doing penetration testing. I don't know who it is. They're all very anonymous. But there's quite a bit of uh, customer interaction. And if somebody goes into a, uh, an interview cussing and screaming about things or, or saying how dumb customers are or how idiotic um, users are, then they're not going to, to gain too many, um, too many positive points throughout that because eventually these managers want to put those people in front of a customer to, to actually represent that business and, and talk to that customer and convey security and risk. So being nice, being well-spoken, as we see in here, um, just being personable really um, goes the extra mile. I can't imagine a, um, a role in information security where you don't need the skills, where you don't need some of those soft skills, because at some point in time, you're going to talk to somebody eventually. Uh, you're not just speaking to a robot, and you're not expected to be a robot. You're going to talk to your team members. You're going to talk to project managers, to customers, to um to various people inside a customer environment, like executives, like end users, um, perhaps technical users as well. So it's good to have that well-rounded skill set above and beyond simply having the minimum requirements for the job. Uh, other than, than going through this, uh, the high skill level is, is an obvious one that you know, if you have more than the, um, than the minimum requirements, then it's going to look good. And I can't really say from my perspective, just gleaning from the notes, how much that plays into the rest of these conversations. If you have a high, high skill level, 
but you're not very personable, it's it's tough to say um, tough to say exactly how that impacts uh, an individual. Any um, any questions about some of these um, these positive points? And it's really high level stuff that that is difficult to um, difficult to measure, but it exists somewhere. Somebody's thinking about this when they're talking to people. So when we're in these um, in these conversations in, in these interviews, thinking about these is uh, is potentially a good idea. Some of the um, the neutral comments that I saw are, are shown here. I'm not going to read these through these line by line, but um, some of the things that that we even talk to one another about is like the uh, the home labs, for example, setting those up and just being familiar with the tools and familiar with uh, setting up, building, and destroying various VMs as needed. Uh, it's it didn't happen. It didn't come up very often. I didn't see that in the notes more than once or twice, which is why there's no plus one or, or plus two here. Um, but I think the home labs definitely carry some value. Um, having the the theoretical knowledge can, um, as you see in the the top row, can sometimes make up for lack of experience. I didn't put it in the notes, but I'll just say it verbally. That person with less hands-on experience, but with good theoretical knowledge, they were hired into this team uh, simply because of that among all the other conversations that they may have had with the management. And there could be other things that um, that, that candidate carried with them into the conversation, such as the, the personal role, uh, being nice, and, and just being able to carry themselves pretty well. So I think there's some, some value to be had there. Some of the um, the negatives that I saw, and and I don't mean to, to bash anyone about this, so I hope that this doesn't come across as that, but there's one that is a pretty heavy hitter, and that's difficult to understand. There's a potential that some of these individuals did not speak English as their first language. I understand that we can't help if, um, if someone has an accent and they may not come across very clearly, but if you do, or if you know somebody who does, then I think they need to try extra hard to come across um, as clear as possible. Not let technology um, wreck their their interview, so to say. Meaning, if if you're on the fence in terms of how you speak to others, if if your level of speaking is not as clear as, say, a native speaker, then make sure that technology helps you rather than hinders you. Make sure you use a, a high quality mic, a high quality camera, if that helps. Uh, or even push for an in-person interview. Now, I'm not sure how often in-person interviews happen these days because of our, our virtual world. And in these conversations, the interviews were audio and video only. <clears throat> this, this team is scattered throughout the United States, so there really isn't a, a central office location for them, from what I understand, because they're an anonymous company. Uh, but if you're going to, um, to have those those interviews remotely, make sure your, your equipment is is working well. And test it beforehand and, and make sure to do a mic check and a video check so that you run into fewer technical difficulties if you think you're on that borderline of not being um, clearly understood. And even talking a little bit more about that, uh, practice with someone. And practice with someone who is virtual. So set up a Discord meeting or set up a, um, a quick Zoom call with somebody and double check your equipment, and this is coming completely off the cuff um, when I think about this difficult to understand point, set up your technology and test it beforehand. Oftentimes we, um, we make assumptions in an IT and security field where things are going to work as we built them, but it turns out they don't. So it's, um, it could be worth spending a few extra minutes just to make sure that is, um, is taken care of. The obvious one here on the negatives is the underqualified. The no practical experience segment of that is unfortunately difficult to measure because there was one candidate, according to these notes, that had some um, theoretical experience but no practical hands-on pen, pen testing experience, and they got the job. So there's some there's a little bit of fuzziness, a little bit of um, um, unknown in in terms of this one. But obviously, being underqualified immediately puts you into a uh, a negative pool of candidates. However, that doesn't mean that it's a, um, a death sentence for your job. You can still work toward talking to hiring managers to, most importantly, in my opinion, determine where your weaknesses are and get some feedback from them 
to help yourself become stronger in those weaknesses rather than just saying, oh, okay, I'm too weak and I, I'm never going to be an XYZ role person. Um, so don't take it as, as a be-all, end-all. And if you don't have any uh, practical experience, yet you have the motivation, you have the fire under you to work hard and learn fast, then there could be a place for you. And hiring managers may look for that versus um, someone with a lot of practical experience. Just a side note, and a and my own experience seeing this um, hiring practice in my own company is that I've seen quite a few people being hired who are very well experienced, but they were a terrible fit to the team. They, I don't want to say they were toxic, but they weren't the, the best people to work with because they were so full of themselves that they obviously knew everything and they didn't need to be um, told how to do something. So that kind of just puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth when someone with the top of the top experience gets hired, but they're not trainable and they don't want to learn anything new and they don't want to change their ways or, or somehow fit better with the, um, with the group. That's definitely something to think about if you feel that you are underqualified for a certain role. One thing that really surprised me throughout this is Google searching and reading notes. Um, I know people read notes and I've often told people that during an interview, I think it's okay to take notes and maybe look over your notes, but do find a balancing point where you're not looking at them all the time. If you're Google searching during an interview and the hiring manager can see that you're doing that or can see that your eyes are moving left to right on the screen if you're um, transmitting video, then that's, that's an obvious red flag that you're a very good Googler, but you may not be a very good practitioner for what you're applying for. And that's okay. I think it's better if somebody were to admit that they may not know an answer rather than Google it, uh, instead of Googling it and try to read through an answer really quick and, and, and fuddle through it. Uh, if you partially know the answer, talk through that and say, well, here's the part that I know about it, and here's the part that I'm not quite clear about it, but here's how I would find the rest of the answer. And that could be more appreciative by a hiring manager. If you admit that you don't know the answer, but you talk through how you would find it. Because we in the InfoSec community, we obviously don't have all the answers. We have to Google stuff all day, every day. That, that's a reality of the job. But I don't think it's okay to do that during an interview. Rather, explain how you would find the answer. Because a hiring manager obviously knows you're going to Google stuff. But during an, uh, during an interview, I think there's a better way to uh, to convey your, your search prowess versus um, your inability to answer a question. And if you don't have the ability to answer a question, at least let them know that you don't know the answer or maybe put the question on hold and ask them to come back to it later. Uh, I unfortunately, well, fortunately did that one day um, during a phone interview and that question wasn't returned to. The hiring manager ended up hiring me but he never came back to the, the question I asked to put on hold. Now, I don't know exactly what the question was. Uh, it was many years ago, but it kind of goes to show that that example could work, and maybe you have a forgetful hiring manager that will just kind of lose track of, of what they asked. Kind of try to work through the slides. Basically, the last slide that I was showing, the, um, the negative points is the last slide of this that has um, some real value. So other than talking through things, I don't have too much new information to share. Um, but going through some of the other points, one, um, one point of feedback was that somebody didn't elaborate. And I saw this, I saw this twice in two different, um, uh, two different aspects. One person didn't elaborate, and the other person was very brief with their answers. Now, I, I call that one and the same, and, and generally the same, uh, same behavior. There's, um, there's a fine line between talking too much and not giving enough information. And I think it all depends on the, on the depth of the question. If the question is very technical, there's, there's going to be some talking through it. Uh, there's, it's going to be very difficult to, um, to avoid talking through a, um, a very complex question. But um, if the question is simple, let's say, what is TCP port 33, then I think a, a quick answer for that would be um, would be pretty straightforward. Um, ben, I have slides up. Do you see them? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I uh, can't confirm your 
guaranteed that these are going to stay up for very long. <laughs> um, so in, in terms of elaborating or brief answers, unfortunately I have to gauge that. And what, what makes face-to-face -face interviews so much more powerful is you can read the people in the room. And if you're good at reading body language, you can tell if somebody's waiting for a little more information or if you are talking too much. You can kind of get that feedback in person. It's much more difficult virtually. You can kind of get it over video. Um, unfortunately, on a phone call or an audio call, it's going to be very unlikely for you to pick up on that, on those cues from the others, whether you're talking too much or not or not. Um, I mentioned lacking the basic skills. Yeah, if you don't have um, all the skills they're looking for, you may not even get into the interview. But if you do get into the interview, you either um, slid in under the radar or there's something else about your your yourself, your resume, cover letter, however you got into that interview, something else that carried enough weight to get your foot into that door. And if your foot is in that door, you might as well take advantage of it and basically grab the bull by the horns and take that opportunity to at least do your best. And if your best isn't what's expected or what they were looking for, uh, ask for some feedback and use that feedback to help yourself improve into the future. Uh, just a couple more things at the bottom, lacking the knowledge of the exploits and, um, and some of the vulnerabilities. For, for a technical role that's expected to know certain exploits, yeah, I, I get that that's, um, that's pretty important. And Googling that kind of stuff um, is probably not going to, to win someone um, very many positive points. As, um, as InfoSec practitioners, I think it's our responsibility to keep up with the news and at least try to remember some of it. Remember some of the, the, the big nasty exploits. Uh, remember some of the big breaches. Remember um, some of the, the common pitfalls that companies make. Know the OWASP top 10. Um, know at least, not like the back of your hand, but know the gist of the CIS controls and what they're asking for. Understand some of the tools, understand the difference between what Nessus does and what NetSparker does, and understand some of the, the tool's strengths and weaknesses, because every tool um, has strengths and weaknesses like that. Um, what else? The, the last point is also really vague in, in this anonymous company. They will actually open up and say, on a scale of one to 10, where would you rate yourself on network skills, on application skills, on mobile applications, on internal networks, external networks, on um, other stuff like that. And and I think if that is asked of you early on, or even in the middle, because by the end of the, the conversation, the hiring manager is going to know what your skill level is. And, and it's going to be difficult to say, well, I'm a 10 on application testing, but at the end of that, you can barely spell OWASP, then there's going to be a big disconnect between um, where you rated yourself and what the um, what the skill level is um, is looking for from the hiring manager. So be realistic, and I would say be conservative. If you can realistically rate yourself as a six or seven, and you know your way around applications, and you really know your way around Active Directory um, domains, score yourself a little bit lower and impress them by the way you talk through it, rather than trying to meet that number or meet that score. Uh, I think that that conservative approach can uh, make you look better based on how you talk through things rather than how you rate yourself on things. Because the, the truth will come out. It'll, um, it'll come through the way you speak. I believe I spoke through most of this uh, throughout the, the earlier portions of the conversations. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is um, about networking. So for a penetration testing um, perspective, you're going to need to know networking inside and out. And I would imagine for a lot of um, information security roles, maybe not so much on GRC, but a lot of technical roles are going to need to know networking. And to the point where you don't have to look at a book or uh, Google something for the answer. You may need to know this off the top of your head just to be quick and be able to, to follow a conversation. Because during those conversations, you may not be able to Google something. Um, and don't forget to... Uh, just, just consider the way you speak to others and the way you carry your conversation. Uh, the kindness and personality can can make or break some of these um, interviews. Any questions? Has yeah. anyone ever been a hiring manager? Like, have you ever like yeah. been somebody who, who conducted an interview? Mm -hmm. Did you ever receive training in how to conduct an interview? 
No. No. Interesting. Yeah. Most of them don't. Right. right. Most people never receive any kind of training. So what you tend to find as you walk into an interview, I think, is that depending on the skill level of the person who's doing an interview, because it is a skill, you will get very different results from that interview depending on who you end up with uh, sitting across the table. The brief experience I had interviewing and hiring people, I was notified maybe 30 minutes <laughs> before the candidates were coming in that I'd be taking part in the, the interview process for selection. Right. Um, so I can pull the curtain back a little bit. Um, I've probably conducted a significant number of interviews at this point. And a lot of the points that you've talked through are things that, that um, you can distill down into a couple of key elements. People are usually looking for two things. Domain knowledge, you can know the domain that you're looking for, and team fit, right? And if you have both of those things, you're an excellent fit for the position. If Great. you have one of those things, you might be a fit for the position, but it's probably more on the team fit side than it is on the domain knowledge. Because somebody who shows that they can that they can meet a, a couple of key values, like the ability to learn and so forth, and you can't just walk in and say, oh, I'm a really fast learner, because everybody <laughs> says that, right? Um, but you have to be able to demonstrate the ability to, to learn quickly, and then your team fit will carry you through into a position potentially. Those we, are great points. Part of this interviewing is a skill, yeah. and one of the interviewing tactics of an in, like of the hiring manager or just someone that you're participating on the interviewing side is understanding that the person on the other side of the table, unless they're continually in the, the role of interviewing for jobs, which none of us are in the business of wanting to be in that <laughs> position, they're probably racked with nerves, yeah. tension. They're, even though they are working as <clears throat> consciously as possible to put their best foot forward, yeah. more likely than not, there is some part in that 45 minutes, hour, six hours, whatever it may be, where they're going to be flustered or they're going to have, just something's going to go off. The wife got home. The dog barked. Something. Right. And they're going to kind of choke. So as the interviewer, it's kind of important to understand that, you know, it's not like you're up on top of the tower looking down and you're like, <laughs> answer my question. <laughs> so sometimes when you, you catch, like, the audio break or the... the uh, language barrier challenges. It's on the interviewer too to kind of see, like, hey, you're super nervous, but I see, you know, like some potential. Absolutely. And it's on you to, to kind of pivot. Yeah. And if you're sitting on the side of the table where you're interviewing for a position and you see that interviewer who isn't experienced, sometimes what will happen is they will try to be the one who catches you out on things. They will specifically ask you questions that are irrelevant or, or ridiculous. Um, a solid interviewer, somebody who really knows what they're looking for, should do everything in their power to put you at ease because they want you at your best in order to assess whether you're good for a position or not. Yeah. They give you second chances too. Absolutely. So the good Absolutely. ones do, yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, do you know X? And you're like, no, but I can Google it. And you're like, all right, well, that's the de facto generic answer I'm always going to get. Where would you go? Like, tell, walk me through some of the, your go-to resources where you would look, investigate this, not just Google, but right, right, right. Um, the interviewer can kind of coach out when you know you're getting that superficial answer. Not really superficial, but... And just letting that be the thing that stands. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you spoke to this a little bit, saying, you know, how did you get to the answer, right? Don't just, don't just give an answer, but enumerate how you could get to an answer right. if you don't necessarily know it, which is a very good point and a very good tactic. And that's also a skill, an yep. important skill, because that's something we practice every day. We don't know all the answers, and, and I keep going back to that, that if you're skilled at finding the answers, then you're, you're going to find the answer eventually. Yep. Uh, if you totally give up and you don't know the answer, then there's something else that you've lost somewhere in your past. Uh, and, and that's one of the conversations I have, total tangent here, uh, with my kids when arguing what's important about school. School doesn't teach you all the skills of life. School teaches you how to learn, how to teach yourself, or at least good schools do. And that's kind of what they're supposed to do, especially in college and high school in some way. Um, as another aside, I've, I've noticed some of the better interviews that I've ever been in don't feel like interviews. They feel like a conversation. And I don't know if that's because I was able to, to roll with that conversation really well, or if because the interviewer was just so skilled that they could hold an interview and make it feel like a conversation. 
it's a dance. Yeah, it is a dance. One hundred percent. And it's it's unfortunate when you're dancing with Thor and you're a princess, <laughs> and they're stepping all over you, and and they want to see you fail. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is unfortunate. I don't think I've ever been in one of those, um, but I've been in a few where where the other person is just really grumpy, and it was clear that they didn't want to be there, and they didn't they didn't think very highly of me, and they just wanted to call me out on the stuff that I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I wasn't in the right position to say, listen here, asshole. <laughs> but <laughs> rarely are you when you're yeah, in yeah, 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 being interviewed. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and also, if you reach you, a point in the interview where you know it's right. not going anywhere, you might be drawn to start that. And at that point, you're taking everything well, right. Exactly, the other thing to exactly. remember is in the interview, when you get to that point, that's where it's up to you now to determine, yeah. even if they offer me the job, is this a team I want to be a yeah. part of? 100%. Okay? Absolutely. Because having the job is important. Yes, but having a job where you fit well, you work well, you enjoy going to work, not just because of what you do, but the people that you're working with, you're, you know, you walk away, you go into a situation and all of a sudden you find yourself just lost. And, you know, I can walk down the hall and talk to anybody in this hall and they'll drop whatever they're doing, answer my question and help me through the situation that I'm working on. That's not true in every team. Yeah. And sometimes... The other side of this is remembering you are trying to figure out what this team is going to be like from this interview you're getting. And sadly, in many situations, the hiring manager is a person who isn't even part of the team. So you're having a hard time trying to figure out what this team is. But usually you can figure out at least a company culture as to how they view stuff to determine, is this going to be a good fit for me? Am I going to be able to, you know, to work? With these type of people so i mean yes it's important for the hiring managers to be reading you to make sure hey you're going to fit with the team but it's also important for us to make sure that you're reading the company culture if nothing else to make sure hey this is going to be a job that i'm going to fit in um because I, I you know i've i've worked in places where you know we started out as a we became b which was not quite so bad and you know, it wasn't long where we were going in the completely opposite direction, but, you know, I'm one of those hard-headed people who, if I got the job, I'll just keep working. Um, <laughs> and in the long run, it was bad. It, you know, it had health, you know, health health side effects and everything else. And ultimately, you know, when, when it finally came to an end, my wife looked at me and said, I've been praying for this for two and a half years. <laughs> you know, we need to re learn in our industry to read those type of clues as well. When you... You may be with this job, you may be working it, everything's working. When stuff starts going sideways, don't be afraid to admit it. Hey, it's going sideways. Yeah. I need to I need to go look for something else. I need to do something else. I need to transition. Maybe the field in you know, the field in cybersecurity you're working in is expanding so much that you can no longer have a focus that's gonna be broad enough to hold the job. You now really need to be specialized. And you really don't want to do any of those yeah. Specialized roles, you know. Be willing to admit, hey, it's time for me to move on. It's time for me to, you know, take a step back and reevaluate what I'm going to do. And sometimes that interview process is the time that you really need to make that determination. Is this really one I want to go after? Well, and solid interviewers should always ask at the very end, "Do you have any questions for us?" Mm -hmm. um, and we will often learn uh, from those questions more than we would from the questions that we ask. Right, so yeah. um, it's really important to prepare solid questions because asking good questions um, is also a key indicator of whether or not you're uh, a good fit for a position. Hopefully, if the conversation is going well, sorry, I'll let you jump in. Um, hopefully, if the conversation is going really well, you can interject those questions and interview the interviewer as the interviewee and find out more about the company culture. Uh, during the interview rather than waiting to the very end where you then ask the question. Yeah. Because um, I've put, put together some interview notes which has maybe 40 or 50 of those questions. Those questions could literally take you several hours to go through <laughs> yeah. with the interview. And, and it wouldn't be natural to, to just kind of fire away uh, one after the other. But it's much more natural to have those, those interjections throughout the interview and, and maybe ask some follow-up questions based on the, the question that the interview is asking you. That could only depend on the the conversational nature of the interviewer and, and just how things are going. Mm -hmm. uh, if you feel like you're tanking, you may not even get the opportunity to to ask those questions, or or might not even be taken seriously when you do. Yeah.
Oh yeah, so I was going to follow up on that of the when you are allowed to ask questions. How do you ask questions about things like work-life balance or benefits or things like that without looking needy or high maintenance and making them think, oh, this person just did it for what they want, even though that's not necessarily the case. You just sure. want to know, what am I getting into? Is there a way to ask those without? The, the best way, and that's why I related to a dance, is to find it strategically and the conversation is part of it. So let's say as part of the interview, your interviewer asks you, you know, are you comfortable working nights and weekends periodically? You know, or are you okay with a, a flexible schedule? Like once you're in the kind of topic, the talking segment, like we're no longer talking tech, we're no longer talking, you know, like a, a scenario driven question, but we're talking work life balance, but not in the same way that you're gonna phrase it. I'm looking at it from the employer side, so I'm gonna start phrasing some questions to you. And there's almost always a segment in the interview where, depending on the role, where this is a the type of questions asked, like, hey, if I call you on Saturday, what's what are you gonna do? This is where on your side of it, like once you kind of give that answer and you you see that it's acknowledged and there's not an immediate follow up. It's just like that dance though, because one misstep and it might be you're speaking in the middle of their next question. Mm -hmm. You fit it into that segment. Like you're not waiting to the very end where it's a, do you have any questions for me? But it's more of a natural flow that teeing off of the topic where we're talking in this realm of like, balance, you can then fit in your question to say, you know, what is the, the overall work-life balance for the team? Like how many members am I sharing that responsibility with? Mm -hmm. on the annual call on nights and weekends. And when you say periodically, what does that mean? Can you give some examples? Of exactly. Yeah. By taking really the context of their question, build on top of it, and bring it back. And it, that, it goes back to what Luke was saying too, because now it becomes a definite conversation. It's just not a question and answer. Now it's right. yeah. you're engaging in a similar topic, wrestling to the same. Completely. Yeah, and, and I think that a lot of questions about culture are totally appropriate for the interview. So if you're asking about, you know, what is the culture here? What does a typical week look like? Um, you know, how many people on the team? What it like? Uh, what 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 kind of um, you know, what percentage of, of the time would you be expected to work after hours? All of those are fair questions. I would tend to say questions about benefits, salary, or anything else until after the interview. So first, handle the interview, and then use your, like, once you're offered the position, then negotiate benefits and salary and that sort of thing after the fact. Separate from the interview itself? Correct. Or waiting till the end of the interview? No, separate the from the interview itself. Because the interview is, can you get an offer? Right. Yeah, Once you get an sure. offer, then you can negotiate. Maybe you would prefer to have better, um, uh, more salary or more benefits or, or more work-life balance. But um, I tend to would tend to focus most of the questions on the culture of the the company during the interview to see if it's a cultural fit first, mm -hmm. and then obviously everybody has to get paid, so the financial fit yeah. comes second during the negotiation phase. The other thing you can do is ask a broader question that includes the question you're really looking for. Like, it could be said, what's a typical day like here, working here in this role? Your real question is, am I going to get home by 6 o'clock at night? Mm -hmm. But in the course of them telling you that, they're, you know, they may reveal, you know, and that makes it not quite that needy kind of, you know, you know feel of, am I going to have to work too much here? You know, but at the same time, you're, you're getting that answer in there. No, oh, but, yeah. Yeah. Yep. The key Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. As much as you're being interviewed, go into it fully understanding that you're also interviewing them. Like, you ultimately have a decision to make too. Now, our life situation always dictates a little bit on how much we're really in a, a position of choice. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if you have that area in your life where you do, it's ultimately your space to learn. And that same time window as the employer is, do you want to work here with, with this company? And they might take a subsequent interview. Like, that is rare. Like, if norm <clears throat> the employer normally dictates the interview process as far as how many times we're going to meet or how many series or stages. Is it just one? Or are you going to run with two? But I have been in a situation where, like, employer was on the up. We were prepared to make an offer. But the employee, the prospect, wanted to have one more interview because they were uncertain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a key mm -hmm. that go into it fully interviewing them. And as much as we spend time, just like this conversation, and we're talking about the interviewer side here, but we learn, we focus in on the interviewee prospect. 
watch a video of training to be an interviewer, learn what a good interviewer is like as opposed to a bad interviewer, because you're getting into like a small lens of what your manager might be like. So having that kind of cues, you know, watch the the top 10 trips tips to look at for a good interviewer and the top 10 bad tips. I'm sure that video is out there on YouTube, right? There's probably 50 of them. Right. So watch a few of those just so that you can see them to build on your own library, your own index, because we all like there's triggers for me, like for candidates or for people I'm interviewed, like if I'm being interviewed, you know, if my the person sitting across from me, like you lose your attention, you're gonna start dialing in on this, but guess what? Problem. But that's a me thing, I mean it's probably in the top ten. But that was on my personal list, but by going through that content. Have your own index of what to look for as far as bad cues. Not to say that you would turn the employment down if they made you an offer, but you have to weigh that too. That's your moment. And understand that sometimes the interviewer isn't going to have the power to answer the question. Like you're asking about benefits. At the university, when we're interviewing, whenever we're interviewing people. I can't tell them how much we're going to pay them. I can't tell them what the benefits are because that's the responsibility of HR and HR holds on to that. So it's only once the job's been extended to them that now we can have this conversation and say, okay, this is what we're going to pay you. This is what you know the benefits are and all that stuff. Are you willing to work for that point? But we have to get it to a certain point before we even know the answer to that. So you might be in an interview and ask a question. Don't think that they're putting you off or they're just trying to hide something. It may be truly that they're not allowed because of company policy or whatever else to, in that situation, discuss that type of an item with you at that time. Do you clearly state that? We do. Excellent. We do. When you, if somebody asks us in like the first interview, hey, you know, what's the job pay? You know, I I can't say because you know that's all handled by HR, and it's only after we've extended an invite for you to come work for us that we can give you salary and you know let them talk with you about benefits and all that stuff and even when when we hire somebody i can say okay it's going to pay somewhere in this range i don't even know the final number because if they go to hr and hr is the one who then hands them the contract with here's your final number are you you know basically willing to work for this um again and that's just different in every company some companies the manager who's hiring knows what they're going to pay for it some of them know what they're going to pay for it and will try everything they can to hide it because they know how bad that salary is for the job and they're just trying to entice you to come on work for them and then hope you're going to bite when they now hand you this you know small little number too so you know again it's all you know some of that is reading with those people and trying to figure out where exactly that falls that's a tricky balance particularly if you're at the seventh interview or seventh round, and you finally start talking about salary when you could have just said that in the first 10 minutes of the interview and on round one. If yeah, I'm seventh interview, I need to be booking time on a time card somewhere. Exactly. To get some yeah. Yeah. Well, I've heard these horror stories where people yeah. are dragged out that far, maybe three yes. or four. Yes. But um, they're, they're dragged out to multiple rounds of interviews, and, and they didn't get the job, but they literally invested 10 plus hours into just the interview. And here's the nice thing about that. If you go out and search the, those companies and search for, you know, hiring practices and stuff like that, and those type of things usually show up on the web yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. Glassdoor has been a big one for that. Then yeah. you can go, mm, yeah, all right, I know that this yeah. is the way they, they do stuff. You know, do I even want to start the process? You know, so some of that, you know, hey, I can go look it up. The same is true for go look up the employers. Go look up what their culture is. What different people have to say. Understand that you know it's a perspective. They may be true, they may not be true, but at least understand that hey, this is somebody's perspective on it, and this is this person's perspective. This person, when you get a hundred people and eighty-five of them are all complaining, and it's, it's hard recent. to say that this is a positive company yeah. to work for. <laughs> yeah, and it's in the recent window because with sea levels changing every like every three to five years, often and yeah. a lot of that sub-tier, that yeah. culture is is shifting and changing every yes. three to five years. Yeah. yeah. The way I'd like to look at it is being on the interviewing side, I'm fishing. Like, 
You don't know what's on the other. You, I know what bait I got. My skills. My of course. Resume, right. Right. Just kidding. That's your, <laughs> not, not That's your yeah. <laughs> But I'm like literal fishing because you don't get to know the size of the fish before you catch it. You don't know the amount of work or effort that's going to go into bringing that fish in. But you cast the line and with like you bait the hook, you cast the line anyway. Typically, you're trying to cast many lines. Yeah. But you still have to go through all the work and effort and energy to get to the end, which is normally going to be the negotiation phase of, hey, we're extending an offer. Mm -hmm. And now you're in the finer, de finer detail part. So mm -hmm. just understand that it's never a waste of your time. Like, you might make the personal call of eight interviews. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's too That's much. too much. Yeah. But, like, I went through a six-hour interview once. One day, six hours, like a full half day, whatever. Great lunch in there. So I, I call it was worth it for that. I took the job anyway, but that was the most extreme interview yeah. I went through. It was a lot of effort, and I knew it kind of going into it because I knew that that was the schedule going into it. But they also, I was like, why six hours to the recruiter? I'm like, well, you're meeting with this team, you're meeting with this team, and then you're meeting with this team. Like, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Look. Kudos to them for putting somewhat of an agenda together for it instead of just being like, fuck, I just want to be there. And that's why I asked, the, like, yeah. even me, this was like eight years ago, but I'm like, you for real? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not that common, but it was still the fishing. I had no idea what was on the other end of that line. I didn't know what it was after the six hours of interview or what the offer potentially could be pay range-wise, benefits-wise, or anything. But I still went through that. And that's actually why I'm here. It was the job I took in South Carolina when I moved down here. So, And you found that there was a whale at the end of that line. <laughs> no, it's like it was advertised as a whale, like to become a whale. It was a tuna. Yeah. <laughs> they can be a few hundred. Was that tuna? Still an unusually large fish. However. Yeah, it's still an unusually large fish. But, and one that's tasty. True, true. true. But just think of it that way. That it, it can seem hopeless, just like fishing. You can go a full, you know, multiple trips and not catch jack. Yeah. It's still worth the effort, though. If you are in that position, there's a position that you want that your your needs aren't met by your current situation. Keep at it. The other minor thing I, I thought of too is don't go into anything with demands up front, because mm. that does happen. Like minimum salaries. Like I hate, and I understand it, but I hate the the talk of salary in that first interview. It's kind of a detractor. It does happen, though. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be brought up either by someone you know, sitting beside you on the interviewing side or by the interviewee. At least someone out of your pool is going to do it. Um, but there's also, like, I, up front, they're like, I need four weeks of vacation. And I'm like, we're not in a place we're where not. we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Not there yet. Right. Yeah. So hold demands. Mm -hmm. even, like, even if they're a personal hard demand for you, that you won't compromise on, save it till the end. Mm -hmm. Prove your value with that hiring manager because at the end of the day, what you want is that hiring manager to be an advocate for you yep. for to what it you is mean. that you're gonna That's ask for. Yeah. Any comments on the call? Don't wanna forget about you guys. On the be nice thing. I know Anonymous, I watch their videos. They're always pretty nice. I mean, they got the, the guy Fox mask going on, <laughs> but I mean, Anonymous, you guys are real classy acts. I would love to work for you guys. <laughs> but they're really straightforward because they don't forget and they don't forget. That's right. That's true. <laughs> so we got to balance that with the timing. I was keeping that joke back. I wasn't going to say it. On the giving enough information but not too much, if the uh, person interviewing you is taking notes as you're answering, um, and, and, then you, will. and you stop answering and they're still writing or typing, do you just let this, there be silence while they talk? Or do you continue talking and they continue to know it's a whole lot or just kind of case by case? Think of it like, uh, think of it like this improv group over here, right? Um, every good comedian will tell you don't be afraid of silence, right? Um, mm -hmm. Feel free to elaborate to the point where, and then you can, you can even check in. You can, you can pause for a second and say, I'm going to let you finish writing for a second, or I can keep talking if you prefer. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's okay to be silent. It shows that you are comfortable. Now, don't make it an awkwardly long pause, um, but you, know, you, you can 
you can usually let a few seconds of silence go uh, while you let somebody finish up. That would be my thought. Yeah, and it's all in context also. If it's a one-on-one -on -one interview, it definitely mm -hmm. plays more of a factor. If it's more of a panel interview, mm -hmm. then you can always, you know, like this gentleman or these folks are, are taking notes, then you might want to give an opportunity, like social cue, but make contact with isn't writing and see if there's an engagement there. Yeah. But being comfortable with silence. So think of, as the interviewee, think of yourself as a salesman. You know, when you're in the department store and there's that person there who is trying to get you to, they're in the center of the aisle and they're trying to get you to buy that AT&T plan that's just a deal. And they don't know how to shut up. They don't know how to listen to you. When you give them an answer, they aren't listening. They're just going to keep talking. How that drives you up a wall, you want to try to, you're a salesman of yourself. So again, think of those things when you're working with the interviews and with the interviewer and, you know, Sell yourself. Hey, I can show that I can be part of even this team of, I'm not really sure who I am and who these people are, but I'm going to try to present myself as being a part of the team to the extent that I can. And that's the salesman side of being an interview and, you know, going and presenting yourself to somebody else. So they're asking questions online, but we cannot hear them. Okay. Well, if you guys want to type into the chat in the question, we can answer it. Meeting chat, and we'll work to find out 